All right, welcome to Decisions Not Options in the Age of Gutenberg, which is just such a fancy sounding title. Um, the talk has kind of evolved since I originally pitched it, um, so I hope you still enjoy it. First, a little bit about me. That is me. I am at Chris Van Patten on Twitter. Please follow me there. It both uh, stokes my ego, but also that's where I'm going to be putting the link to the slides uh, shortly after this presentation. So definitely check that out. Um, you'll also get random musings about life and Gutenberg and all kinds of stuff. Uh, as mentioned, I am the founder and creative director of Tomodomo. That is a Japanese word meaning togetherness, or each and every one. Um, and we specifically work with magazine publishers, especially smaller magazine publishers, um, to help them build out their WordPress presence. Um, and so I'm super happy to be here with other publishers and other companies who work with publishers. Uh, I love publishing, I love magazines, um, I, I really, I love print, which is kind of funny, because this is a WordPress digital conference. Um, a few years ago I went on a trip and was gone for like a month and a half, two months. I came back to this stack of magazines um, that's all the stuff I subscribe to, and that's actually pretty indicative of my, my love of print. Um, but even long before that, um, I actually studied theater. This was a set and projection design that I did for a show. I moved to New York for a little while and did that before committing full-time to WordPress. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I started doing theater around 10 or 11, um, and there's only one love of my life that have, has also existed as long, um, and that is, of course, WordPress. So a little history lesson. Uh, in the beginning, this, this is WordPress. Uh, this is the first version of WordPress that I remember using, um, gosh, you know, going on 15 years ago. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. This is the editor, obviously. This is creating a new post. Um, this is pre-Tiny MCE. This is when we had quick tags, um, which were basically WordPress's kind of version of, uh, of um, like EB code or one of those old forum style uh, syntaxes, pretty straightforward. Um, moving up through the years, we come here, and honestly, like this is this is Tiny MC, but this is kind of what we stuck with for a while. So at this point, we have a visual editor. Um, around this time, I think short codes had just come in, custom fields in the bottom, your kind of meta boxes on the side there. Um, of course, here is 3.0, uh, and this was kind of the template for a long time, from 3.0 to now 497. This is kind of roughly what we still have, and a lot of that code is still very similar. Um, and it was good. It was great. We loved it. Um, we got used to it. We got used to that model of sidebar of links, forms, and tiny MC in the middle, and then meta boxes on the side and below. There are familiar integration points. So of course we all know and love or loathe tiny MCE. Uh, short codes. Everyone loves short codes. Um, and meta boxes. We got used to all of this. These are, this is the vernacular of developing WordPress editing interfaces. Um, the tools are familiar to customize that. So of course, Advanced Custom Fields does a lot of the work for us. CMB2 did a lot of the work for us. Pods did a lot of the work for us. Work for us. And of course, WordPress did a lot for us. Um, we're, we're used to it. We got used to it. Um, but the fact of the matter is uh, that change is coming, um, and you can see change is kind of creeping in. Um, so the stuff that used to work will continue to work, but it won't be the best user experience anymore. Um, and that's because there is now the introduction of a whole new vernacular. We've got so much new stuff coming with Gutenberg, of course Gutenberg being the new editor interface for WordPress. Um, so we've got blocks, we've got inspectors, We've got toolbars, we've got menus. You ain't used to this. None of us are, it's brand new, it's still being developed. Um, so with all these new integration points, we need to think very carefully. How can we create intuitive, elegant, and easy interfaces that fit in with Gutenberg and also follow and reflect the WordPress philosophy? We'll get to those uh, right now. So philosophy, WordPress has them. Um, and I'm gonna kind of run down a couple of them right now. Design for the majority. I love this one. Try to solve the most, most people's problems uh, when you're designing something. Uh, out of the box, it should just work. It should be intuitive. It should just, you shouldn't have to jump through a lot of hoops to make something work. Striving for simplicity. I don't really need to elaborate much on this one. Simple is usually better, most of the time. 
Um, and this is one of my favorites too, the vocal minority, which is that sometimes the loudest people on a project aren't necessarily the people whose opinions you need to follow. Uh, if you've ever spent time in a comment section or uh, recently the GitHub issues on Gutenberg, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of jabbering about, um, and we appreciate that, but we don't necessarily need to uh, listen to all of that. Or we need to listen to all of it, but we don't necessarily need to make uh, changes based on all of that. Um, again, that goes back to design for the majority, not the vocal minority. And of course, the one that everyone loves to reference, uh, decisions, not options. And this is one that has been incredibly uh, controversial since it uh, was added to the WordPress philosophy. Um, and this is the idea that WordPress should, generally speaking, um, make smart decisions on behalf of its users. Um, and Gutenberg is a really interesting case where all of a sudden you have all kinds of options that you didn't have before, or the option to have options uh, because of the user interface. So as we're kind of working on adapting to Gutenberg, this is a really great opportunity to kind of revisit everything that we've been doing and say, okay, what are the options that we actually need to provide? What are the decisions that we can make on behalf of our users? Um, of course, these are guidelines, not rules. And in particular, these guidelines are intended for WordPress core itself. Uh, you don't necessarily have to follow them when you're building something yourself uh, you know, for a client or for your, your employer, um, but they're useful. Um, because the more unified a user experience is, the more consistent a user experience is, the more consistent a UI design is, uh, that sort of begets usability. So predictability begets usability. So the more that we can kind of follow the WordPress way of doing things, the more luck our user is going to have and the more uh, the, the ease of use is going to be ramped up dramatically there. So as we consider our integration points, uh, which we're going to go over in a second, we need to consider the philosophy. We want to be the philosophy that we want to see in the world. Um, so as you're thinking about stuff, think carefully about where a control belongs, literally where it's placed. Think carefully about whether or not a control should exist in the first place. There are really good reasons why you might want to provide fewer options than more options. Support the most essential options and no more. Um, this is something I believe really strongly about. It kind of goes with the last item, but really think like, what are the actual things that need to be controlled here? Um, what are the options that a client or an end user needs to have? Um, because a lot of the time, they don't need the options that they think they need. And also, and we'll get to this later, you might think of options that you think they might need, but they don't actually need. So try to be really careful, because the more options that you add, the more points of breaking you've introduced into your code, into your design. Um, every new item that you add, any new checkbox that you add, that's something you need to maintain, that's something that you need to train on. Um, it just adds additional layers of complexity, and those layers of complexity uh, compound over time. And of course, make decisions that let your users feel like they have options. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is introducing magic into your UI, providing really intuitive presets rather than specific you know, fine grain checkboxes. It's uh, trying to infer based on the context. So, hey, we see you're adding a particular post into a post type. Maybe we can provide you some options that reflect the needs of that post type versus something that's like, here are a million options for all post types. Um, so just trying to be intuitive and trying to be smart uh, about what those options are that you need to provide. All right, so now we're gonna go into the fun part, which is we're going to meet the user interface. Um, how many people in the room have played with Gutenberg? Awesome, I gave a similar talk, a somewhat similar talk on Gutenberg like a month ago, and I asked the same question, and no one raised their hands. So this is refreshing to see. Um, but what I'm gonna do in the next section here is I'm gonna walk you through the different integration points that you have in Gutenberg when you're building a block. Um, Basically, uh, the goal here is that there are all kinds of places where you can put controls and options and things, um, but not every place is right for every type of control. So we're gonna go over what the different types of controls are. So first, and most familiar to everybody, it is the toolbar. This is a toolbar on a paragraph block. Uh, it's pretty familiar. It's icons you know, it's icons you love. Um, from TinyMCE, and in fact, uh, TinyMCE is what powers all of the rich text uh, 
functionality uh, in Gutenberg. So this is actually a little tiny MCE instance that lives inside of the paragraph block, which you probably don't need to worry about, but just, you know, that we're, we're trying to make the transition a little easier by keeping a lot of that stuff around. Um, and toolbar buttons uh, are kind of interesting because in tiny MCE, a toolbar button can do a lot of different things um, in the classic editor. Uh, most often, most commonly, it's used for formatting. You can see the formatting options up here uh, still exist. Um, but sometimes it can also be used to insert things. Sometimes it can be used to pop up modals and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, a lot of that, all, all of it really, is still technically possible in Gutenberg. Um, but you want to try to avoid that. There are better ways for doing a lot of that stuff. Typically, the way that I describe it is that a toolbar button should have one, an instant impact, and two, it should probably be changing the visual appearance of the block, if not instantly, then like very quickly. So, uh, for example, uh, bold and italics, strike through, those are easy to appreciate, you can understand what those do, but they're an they're in instant change, they reflect on the visual content of the block inside of the block canvas, which we're going to get to uh, in a second. So they're kind of instant impact changes. Um, at least most of the time, but in particular, they're changing the actual visual appearance of a block uh, in real time in the interface. Next up is the block action menu, or the block side menu. Now, this is an interesting one because this is the first one that we're coming to that is a whole new paradigm in Gutenberg. There is no analog for this in TinyMCE in the classic editor. The block action menu is also a little hard to kind of exactly pin down what it's for. Um, you can see the options in here. These are the defaults on a paragraph block, but blocks can add their own options in here. Um, so we've got show block settings. That pops open the sidebar, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, edit as HTML, which is exactly what it sounds like. It lets you edit the HTML representation of the block. Duplicate. That's exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, and convert to shared block. Now, in the latest version of Gutenberg, this is now convert to reusable block. Um, and that basically allows you to take a block and save it into the database and use it in different places on the site. So when you edit it in one place, it changes in all places. Um, we're using that functionality for things like calls to action, um, for specific menu, like li lists of links that get placed in a lot of places on the site, um, stuff like that. And of course, remove block. Now, what is the common thread through all of this? It's not necessarily easy to tell. Um, the way that I've broken it down and defined it is that the block action menu is for features or functionality that change the block's relation to either the rest of the content. Um, so in this case, uh, edit HTML, um, I'm sorry, for duplicate, convert to shared block, it's changing its representation. Uh, with either the document, with the site, or with the user interface. So edit is HTML and show block settings relate to the user interface. They change the way the block is represented in the user interface. Duplicate obviously changes the block's representation to a page by adding to the page. Uh, convert to shared block uh, does the same thing. It changes the way that block is represented on the page, but also changes the user interface. So these are for things that may not necessarily immediately change the content of the block, but change the block's relationship with the rest of the site, with the rest of the document, and so on and so forth. Um, this one is interesting because it only recently, I think maybe two releases ago, um, got the ability to add new items. Uh, you know, a block can add its own items in here, and we haven't seen a ton of use cases for it yet. Um, so that's going to be evolving uh, as well. Um, the other thing here, too, is that it does change the block's relationship to the document by also changing the document. So duplicate is a good example where we're creating another block. Um, I think in maybe 3.6 of Gutenberg, they're going to be adding the ability to insert a block above or below um, from this menu. So there'll be an option to insert block above, insert block below. So it, again, it's kind of, it's, I think the, the key word for me is relationship. This is about changing the block's relationship to the rest of the content or the rest of the site. The block canvas. Um, so this is another fun one because um, for kind of the first time, we can go in here and you can see this gallery block up here. That's a block placeholder. So we can actually have controls in line in the editor um, that you can interact with. This was kind of possible with tiny MCE views, but if anyone has worked with the tiny MCE views API, you know it's a nightmare. 
Um, so this is kind of really the first time that we're going to be able to insert kind of arbitrary controls into a user interface. Um, and of course, below we've got a paragraph block canvas, and that you can directly interact with. So block canvas is another one that we're still kind of figuring out, but the two primary situations that I've seen are either the rich text editor below, so whether you're making like a custom heading block, or we recently did a text accordion block, where you can actually just put your content in line. Um, but then of course the other use case above here with the gallery is being able to upload directly <coughs> into a placeholder, being able to pop open the media library. Um, for a lot of the embed blocks, you can paste in a URL uh, to be able to um, just put your, your embed right in line there. Um, the block canvas I think is going to be really interesting to see how that evolves over time. Um, in Gutenberg Core a lot of the use cases are supporting rich text content um, or these kind of media placeholders. And I'm excited to see what plugin developers do when they get a hold of this um, to start doing some interesting things in the block canvas. One idea that I had that I haven't got around to implementing is like, you theoretically can put any kind of content in here. So I'm thinking of maybe making a solitaire block. It would be a game of solitaire that you could insert as a block and just play it in line in the editor if you really wanted to. That kind of use case would be um, possible to do with the canvas. And now we get into the, the really fun stuff, the block inspector. Um, the block inspector is kind of another one that's like really challenging because this could really easily turn into just like all of your settings and check boxes and text boxes and text areas and all kinds of stuff, sliders and toggles and switches and it could get really overwhelming really fast. Um, and that's something that we've seen building blocks that kind of the instinct is to go in here and just put all your settings in the inspector. Um, but you have to be really careful when you do that. Um, the inspector, first and foremost, you want to make sure that the controls that you put in here have smart defaults. And the reason for that is that there's that little X at the top of the inspector. You can hide it. Um, and I think it's going to be likely that especially for, for non-technical users, they might hide the, the inspector and then like forget that it exists. Um, so when you're inserting a block, you want to make sure that whatever controls you have in here kind of have smart defaults. So with the paragraph block, um, the defaults are really simple. It doesn't impose a text size. It's just the default text size. It doesn't turn on drop cap. The color settings are empty, so it's just black text, white background. Um, as you're building your custom blocks, you want to think carefully, like, which switches should you toggle on by default? Of course, going back, you want to think, should you have switches in there at all? Um, so think really uh, a lot about that. Um, one thing here as well is that typically you're not going to have, uh, these controls typically modify the content of the block. They don't necessarily change the content of the block, but they, they change its appearance. That doesn't always hold true, um, especially if you're using server-side render blocks, so blocks where um, the server spits out some HTML at you um, because you're rendering them with PHP. Um, I won't go too much into the complexities of that, but in those cases, um, you really can't have uh, like a, a rich text editor in the editor um, if you're using server-side render, um, which I think for a lot of implementers is gonna be a big fallback to kind of quickly convert short codes over. And I can get more into that in the Q&A later. Next up, you've got the document inspector. So this is the same thing as before. Um, we've just moved over to the document tab. And the document tab is an interesting one because it kind of is stuff that applies to the whole document, but also that's not always true because there's stuff that we're bringing over from, um, from legacy WordPress. So these are a lot of the things you can see in your sidebar. Um, there's not a ton to, to say here. Um, you can extend this, you can add your own panels, but of course think really hard whether it's something is better as a block setting or something is better as a document setting. I, I think more often than not, things that you once might have considered document settings are now better as block settings. Um, but you know that can, of course, change. And we've got another fun one here. This is the plugin sidebar. So this we haven't seen a ton of use cases for in the wild, but plugins can actually register their own sidebars. They get triggered on the right-hand side. You can see here they get triggered from the three dot menu, and you can pop open a plugin, and it gets its own sidebar. So this is one that inserts. Uh, GIFs from Giphy. You could also insert photos from Unsplash. Um, we haven't seen a ton of use cases. This was kind of the big one that I could find quickly because um, I've used it before. Um, and what this does is it basically gives you an interface for picking an image from a search and then it inserts that image as an image block. 
um, again, we haven't seen a ton of use cases for it yet, so this is an interesting example of like, it's an interface for choosing a thing to insert as a block, but there could be other use cases here too. Um, one off the top of my head is that Yoast SEO might use this to display some of their settings. They might have a plugin sidebar that displays Yoast settings um, versus the alternative, which might be um, to insert that stuff in the document inspector as separate panels. So kind of deciding which way you want to go as a document panel or a plugin. Um, there's a bit of leeway there that you have. Um, but again, it's just kind of what is the most intuitive place for that. And the nice thing too about plugins, you can see up at the top on the right there, the slashes, um, those plugins can also get easy access from the top menu bar. Um, you can see that up there that it's like got quick access to that plugin. So you can provide your own icon and users can just hit that and pop open your, your custom sidebar uh, pretty quickly. All right, so now I want to go through some scenarios. So I'm going to show you a couple blocks that we've built um, and we can kind of I'll just kind of explain why we put the controls where we put them. So this is Gutenberg. Hello, WordCamp. So this is a post block that we built. And this, um, there's a recent post in Gutenberg, but this is kind of our own take on that with a little more customization. So over here, um, you can see that we've already broken the rules that I just gave you. So this one actually does control the content in the block. Um, it does modify also the visual display of the block, but primarily that interface up top um, is where you can go in and you can choose category, you can choose posts, um, and that decides what populates here. Now the reason that we did that, that you have those controls on the side there instead of over here in the block, um, is one, this is a server-side rendered block. So this is PHP is spitting all of this out, um, returning it a REST API call to show here. Um, so there wasn't really a provision for adding that stuff in the block canvas or as toolbar buttons. Because also it's a little more complicated than a toolbar button. Um, the other thing that I want to point out about this, if I can get it to replay, um, is that this was a case where we gave the client more options than we ended up shipping. Um, so I'm going to scroll down here in a second. Um, and you're going to see on the sidebar here just a hint of it, where I, there's like a, a toggle that's going to show up. Any second now, should have done this. There we go. So like show post title and show post subhead. The original plan was we would let them decide in these post blocks if we were going to show a title or show a subhead or show the byline or show a featured image. And ultimately we realized they didn't need that level of control. And actually, um, if I replay this, um, those kind of presets that we provided in the sidebar where they can see a little screenshot, the post block display options we called them, we actually just hard-coded those checkboxes based on what the display options are. So those little toggles there are no longer even in the interface at all. Um, and that was a case where we over-delivered. We are like, oh, we've got this inspector. We can throw all kinds of options in. And then realize, oh, wait, they don't actually need or benefit from those options. So we got rid of those. Uh, here we go, another one. This is the text accordion. So this is an example of a block that's primarily controlled in the block interface. So you can put your, like we're using this for FAQs, um, you can use this for spoilers or whatever. Um, and this one's also open source, you can grab this on our GitHub. Um, you've got the title up there, which is just a rich text component in line, but then we're using inner blocks down here, which is fun because that allows the client to insert any kind of block content that they want inside of a text accordion. Um, and really simple examples over there that are optional things. So we leave the block closed by default. That doesn't reflect in the editor, so you can edit it. Um, but that reflects on the front end. And then the anchor attribute, which allows them to kind of like have a little hash anchor that they can link directly to the content. Um, so this is an example where it's really a super simple interface, but also because we're using inner blocks, they can actually insert any content in there and have access to all those different formatting controls without us needing to bake that into the block. Another example here, and this is the section header. So, Gutenberg, of course, by default has header tags. You can insert your H1, H2, so on and so forth. Um, but our client actually had a couple different styles of, of these that we needed, and also needed text controls, or text color controls, excuse me, which the core heading block doesn't provide. Um, and these are for section headers, these are for like certain page titles and things. Um, so this is another example of where the primary editing happens in that um, 
in the canvas, you're actually inserting your text in the canvas, um, and we set the default, so we use their default section header, which they use most of the time, we set the color to what they need, but they can also use um, the design options we've provided them in the sidebar there. In the future, we might migrate away from those thumbnails that you can pick there to something where you can actually set it as a toolbar button. Um, for now, this is what we went with. And again, this kind of reflects sort of the fluidity of the interface where you can put controls in a lot of different places um, and ultimately have um, you know, the same impact. It's just kind of what's more intuitive, what's more usable, um, and yeah. So points of confusion. Um, so like I just referenced, you can put controls in a lot of places. And as part of the, the nature of Gutenberg being still in really like relatively active development, um, we haven't seen a lot of use cases come out. So these are some of my points of confusion, uh, and I'm going to just share my thoughts on them. So first is the plug-in sidebar versus block inspector versus block canvas. Um, so here we are with those three examples. So we have those that GIF inserting thing in the plugin sidebar. You could also easily imagine that as a GIF block where you select from the block canvas. That is a really easy way you can redo and have the same functionality. Um, of course, in the middle here with the block inspector, um, as you saw in the post block example that I showed you, that's a case of where we're using block inspector for managing the actual content. Um, which, again, I don't necessarily recommend you do unless you have a valid use case for it. So trying to figure out how content should be inserted, whether it deserves to be a block or a plugin that inserts a block, all these different things, um, that can be kind of tricky to decide you know, what the split is there and how you balance those different things. Another one, again, the plugin inspector versus the document inspector, which I mentioned before. Yoast being a really good example, um, and these are just kind of those standard screenshots because Yoast has not released their full Gutenberg compat yet. You can imagine like an SEO uh, interface either existing as a panel in the document inspector or as a plugin. Um, and there are no really good guidelines on like what makes something better in one place versus better uh, in another place. So here are some of my humble recommendations. Use Gutenberg core controls wherever possible, first and foremost. How many people have ever wished for a forms API in WordPress? Okay, we've got one hand, um, two hands, great. Um, Gutenberg is the forms API that we've always wanted. Um, it just happens to be built in React with React components. So we finally have a way that we can insert WordPress core control styled um, with managing help text and labels and all that kind of stuff really easily. It's Gutenberg. That's what we're getting here with the WordPress components. So use those wherever, poss wherever possible, um, because the more that you can commit to standard WordPress design, the better. Of course, there are cases where you can't do that. And I showed you a couple of those um, with the post selector, um, with our design control on the side, both of which are open source, by the way. Um, but we, generally speaking, we try to stick to the native options that Gutenberg provides. Uh, innovate only when core controls won't work, which I just mentioned. There are certain cases where the core controls just don't solve all the use cases yet, um, and that's where you can innovate. Um, but even in those cases, for us, the custom controls that we've built are based on and extend from Gutenberg core controls. So we've tried to expand on those rather than reinvent the wheel. Separate blocks for separate markup, most of the time. Um, this is another one that's really tricky. When do you have a separate block versus just an option on a block? Um, and my rule of thumb tends to be if the markup changes substantially, you probably want another block. Um, that section header block that I showed you before, both of those section headers have exactly the same markup, um, which is why we implemented them in the way we did. Um, but there's a perfectly valid use case of saying, you know what, those should actually be separate blocks because over time they may deviate. Um, that's something you're going to have to figure out for yourself. Um, again, there's no hard and fast rule, they're just kind of ambiguous ideas. Um, the post block is a good example where we went against this recommendation. That post block, the markup changes dramatically depending on which preset you choose. Um, but that was a case where it made sense because ultimately the controls are the same, it's just different markup. You kind of have to balance that a little bit as you're designing these uh, interfaces. Don't fall back to meta boxes. Many of you, when you install Gutenberg on your client's site or your employer's site, you're going to have a bunch of meta boxes that show up. Um, 
they will work, they will likely continue to work, but it's just not a great experience. It can cause some like weird behavior around auto saves um, and it's saving. It's the, the UI is kind of clunky because you kind of have to like scroll down and they're like, kind of under there. It's it's just like not a great user experience. Um, now I say this, we are using some meta boxes for a client. Um, Co-authors Plus hasn't been upgraded to support Gutenberg natively, so there's a meta box. Yoast has not upgraded yet to support Gutenberg, so there's a meta box. Um, it's fine. There's going to be a transition period where it's a little awkward. Um, but one thing I would say is that if you're building in Gutenberg and you're building new stuff, really try hard to build it the Gutenberg way, um, as opposed to building it um, with meta boxes and kind of doing new stuff with meta boxes in Gutenberg. Um, again, plug-in sidebars uh, are really great. Um, document inspector panel is really great. A lot of that stuff can migrate into other places. Um, something that I didn't articulate or, or share with you at all is that soon you're going to be able to create modals. Um, I think actually the code has shipped, but we haven't seen any really big use cases of modals in Gutenberg block plugins and things like that. So modals could be a really good place to put some stuff. Options in code don't have to be options in UI. Um, this is another, this is more of a philosophical point, but if you're not sure whether something should be an option or not that you expose to your client in the UI, maybe just add it as an attribute on your block and then don't expose UI. Just have the default setting um, and then later on it might make it easier to turn into an option that you provide. Um, but you don't necessarily have to commit to that. Um, it's also possible to have options uh, in code that the client can edit as HTML or you can edit as HTML. You know, when you're editing the code representation of the block. So it's not in the UI, but you can still make that change on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, again, as you add these options, you have to be careful because you are adding points of breakage, um, but this can be a really good way to do that without exposing it to the client and the user interface and just making it a little easier to maintain uh, over the long term. Avoid the block settings menu, probably. Um, I have yet to see a use case for customizing and adding items to that block settings menu um, on a per block basis. I'm sure there's a use case out there, which is why I say probably. I just haven't seen one yet. Um, again, the block settings menu is where it kind of ref like changes the block's relationship to the document or to the site. Um, again, there may be good use cases there. I have yet to see one. Conduct user tests. Gutenberg is new. It's exciting. It's different. It's very, very different. So make sure that as you're doing this stuff, as you're designing, um, as you're prototyping, get it in front of your clients. One thing I love about Gutenberg is how easy it is to just like mock something up um, because it, if you are using core components, the core React like inputs and things like that, it's super easy to just sketch something out, see how it looks. Maybe you don't plug everything in, maybe it doesn't all save correctly or serialize correctly, but you can really quickly mock up ideas for user interfaces for your clients and see how they feel about them. So best practices and patterns will emerge over time. And as Gutenberg gets a longer life, as it moves its way to core, as more companies adopt it, um, that's gonna kind of happen uh, sort of organically. We're gonna see more plugins, we're gonna see more blocks created, and we're gonna start to get a sense of like where certain controls belong. And so some of those confusing points that I mentioned before are gonna be smoothed out. But let's speed that up with collaboration. Yay. Um, HIG, Human Interface Guidelines. Human interface guidelines um, are basically a set of documentation that makes it easier to kind of understand how to build an interface for a given platform. Apples are the most famous, and I think probably from what I've seen, still the best in the world. Um, and this is one of the reasons that when you use an Apple product, and I'm not gonna try to start an Apple iOS or you know, Android or something like that, but Apple uh, is really good most of the time uh, at being consistent in their environment because of these guidelines. Third-party apps are usually really good at being consistent with the platform because of these guidelines. Um, and Apple's guidelines are awesome. So like, they go into super crazy detail, um, breaking down you know, the, the anatomy of a window, um, anything, dialogues, image views, outlines, panels, you can go in here and find their recommendations on what kind of makes the most sense for them. So introducing the Gutenberg Human Interface Guidelines. These are a practical resource for Gutenberg UI best practices. They are a template for agencies and product teams who want to build with Gutenberg and want to have internal guidelines, but maybe don't want to start from scratch. 
They're a guide for designers um, who are designing interfaces to figure out what is the best way to do some of this stuff. Because, in my opinion, um, and I think a relatively widely shared opinion, consistency begets predictability, which begets usability. And the more usable our interfaces are, the better they are for clients and for product teams. So they're going to be here. Uh, this is not open source yet, but I'm going to show it to you real quickly. Um, here we go. I can leave my window here. So these are the Gutenberg uh, user interface guidelines. Let me make these full screen for you. Um, and what I've done here, this is still a work in progress, but um, you can go in here and find a lot of recommendations for any area of Gutenberg's interface. Um, so here we go with the block toolbar. Um, I've got some screenshots for you. I've described them. Um, deceptively difficult design element, there you go. Along with some do's and don'ts. Um, and we're gonna be fleshing these out uh, over time, but we wanted to share these and make these public. Um, and in fact, let's do that right now. Make public. Uh, Gutenberg. Ta-da, they're public. So go star those, share those. Um, this documentation kind of exists in Gutenberg already, um, and I, I actually mentioned that here. There are some official guidelines, but they haven't been updated for a while, and one thing I want to point out in particular is that these are very opinionated, whereas I think the official design guidelines might be a little more broad and try to reflect more use cases. I, I'm very opinionated about what you should and should not do in these, um, but I hope to incorporate feedback from the community. They are strong opinion, opinions loosely held, um, and we would love to have your, your input on those. Um, because, of course, uh, each new integration point, as I've said time and time again, is a potential point of complexity or confusion. It's a potential point of maintenance. It's a potential point of, why isn't this thing working? Oh, it's that option that we forgot to upgrade in our block or whatever. Um, so with careful planning, smart guidelines, thoughtful implementation, you'll be able to create Gutenberg experiences that will delight our users and your users uh, and help them to do powerful things. Thank you. And uh, with that said, I'll take questions. Do we have any questions? Yes. So I'm wondering uh, what you're really hoping, um, you've had a lot of suggestions, but what are you hoping that will come about next? Once we launch um, and we start to get feedback and it's in everybody's hands, what, what are you really hoping that is the first thing that you start to see? I would like to see more consistency in Gutenberg user interfaces. Um, and I say that like even some of our own block interfaces are inconsistent from other block interfaces that we've done. Um, and as we've introduced Gutenberg to our clients, and we're, we're Gutenberg first, my agency is now, everything we build is now Gutenberg, no going back. Um, and one of the big complaints or, or suggestions that we've gotten from clients is that, why is this thing in this place, but this thing is in this place? And there, that lack of consistency um, is, I think, a big barrier, especially because there are so many different new ways where you can put options in Gutenberg. So the goal with these guidelines and with my sharing them um, is that we can have more consistency across different blocks from different block implementers um, and just really make the interface more predictable as a result. Also happy to answer any general questions about Gutenberg as well, um, if anyone has them, um, either now or in the hallway. Um, yes? You mentioned co Plus, not yes. putting Gutenberg. Are there plans for it or an alternative like Publish Press? Sure, so the question was, um, I mentioned earlier co-authors plus not supporting Gutenberg yet. Are there plans to do so or alternatives? Uh, I believe, and maybe someone from VIP can speak to this, but I believe they are planning to. It's just that the interface or the, the APIs for Gutenberg have changed relatively quickly in a short amount of time. Um, but I think they're just waiting for things to stabilize. So I, I do expect that will happen. And when I say that it's not compatible with Gutenberg, I just mean that it doesn't have its own like document settings panel. The meta box is still there, still visible. It still works. Um, it's just that there's probably a more gutenberg -y way to do it, and I do expect that to happen. Questions? Again. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned... You had mentioned uh, the, the service, using server-side render to uh, uh, kind of port over short codes. Can you speak briefly on that? Yeah, so server-side render is a capability, a, a functionality component in Gutenberg, whatever you want to call it. 
um, basically makes it, so every block can have a render callback in PHP and it can say, when rendering this block on the front end, it should render with this PHP. Um, you can also do that in Gutenberg with the server-side render block. And that allows you to basically use your PHP render callback in Gutenberg rather than doing your display in React or something. Um, this is generally considered a fallback. Um, I don't, I believe it's safe to say that it's officially like, you probably shouldn't be using this, but you can use it if you need to. Um, so that's just, a, it's really nice because you can have your, your render callback just be do shortcode, use the do shortcode function to um, return a shortcode. So it's a really easy way to port over a block um, from a shortcode or something like that. Uh, cool. Uh, question. Do you know if the uh, WordPress plugin directory is going to start denoting? Oh, if the plugin directory is going to start denoting uh, whether a plugin is Gutenberg friendly or not? Um, yeah, it's really good about forging and stuff, but that's. I would love to see that. I don't know of any conversations about that right now. Um, you can follow the meta tech, the meta channel, excuse me, in a WordPress Slack. Um, I know there are a lot of changes coming to the plugin directory. As far as I know, that's not one of them. But I would love to see that a little checkbox filter option. Is it Gutenberg compatible or not? Um, that would be super cool. Um, good suggestion. If anyone from the .org team is listening. Cool. Any uh, final questions? I'll be around all week. I'll be here until Saturday. So if you don't have a question now but have one later, please feel free to find me, tweet me, um, and... Are we done? Thank you, Chris Van Petten.